Hello everybody and welcome to another A-level chemistry video and in this video we're going to be looking at free radical substitution. In this video we're going to be covering two things. We're going to be looking at the formation of halogenoalkanes using alkanes and then we're going to look at one of the effects of this type of reaction which is depletion of the ozone layer. Before we go into the specifics of the reaction and its mechanism, we need to look at free radicals. Now, free radicals are atoms or molecules with an unpaired electron. So, for instance, and the one that we're going to be looking at in this mechanism, the most common one, is the chlorine free radical. And it's that little dot that represents the free radical. But you can have all sorts of free radicals. It doesn't have to be chlorine. It could be bromine, fluorine, iodine. So those are all halogens, but it doesn't have to be those. We can have more complicated looking molecules. So that's a chlorine bonded to an oxygen, which is called chlorine monoxide. And that has a free radical on the oxygen. So you can see that the oxygen and the chlorine are bonded together, but the oxygen has got an unpaired electron. And we can have other complicated free radicals. So we can have methyl, which is almost methane, but it's lost a hydrogen. And we've got a free radical on here. Or even more complicated still, you could have an ethyl group with a dot above that carbon atom there to be an, another free radical, an ethyl free radical. I'd like you to note that in these more complicated examples, the free radical is positioned on the atom that owns the unpaired electron. So this needs to be specific and we need to make sure that we don't just write, for instance, in this CLO, we don't write CLO with the dot there because that doesn't have any specificity. And similarly, if we have methyl, we can't put the dot there because that looks like it belongs to one of the hydrogen and we can't put it somewhere in the middle because that's not specific enough. So it needs to belong to the atom that you are drawing it next to. And finally, as a consequence of having this unpaired electron, free radicals are very reactive. And that's why they take part in the reactions that we're about to describe. And that's how we are able to get alkanes to react at all. Because as you'll know from the alkanes video, Alkanes are not very reactive. We can pretty much just burn them unless we introduce them to something very, very reactive. And this is where our free radicals come in. To introduce the idea of making halogenoalkanes, I'm going to describe something that you could easily have done in a school lab. For instance, if you put a mixture of an alkane, for instance, hexane, into bright sunlight, or a special lamp that gives out ultraviolet light, the halogen will start to form a halogenoalkane. And it's the ultraviolet part of the light that starts this reaction off. Alkanes wouldn't do anything if we had the same mixture at room temperature in the dark. So for instance, for this picture here, if I got my hexane and I put it into a box, and then therefore it was dark, the hexane mixed with bromine water would not do anything. And so even if you left this mixture for hours and hours in the dark, we wouldn't have any change. However, if we were to do this in the sunlight, this is my sun up here, the sunlight would provide that ultraviolet component that is necessary to start this reaction off. And so if you leave this reaction that's in the sunshine for several hours, the colour of the bromine will disappear because that bromine will react in the presence of the sunlight and the hexane will change and it won't be hexane anymore. We will have made bromohexane and the bromine will have disappeared. We will also make some fumes of another chemical and they will leave and that's hydrogen bromide, HBr. And we won't really be able to tell that this is being formed on a lab scale. In theory, these are misty fumes, 
but you can't really see them very well. What you should do really to, to make that particularly visible is to get something like a glass rod with a drop of ammonia on the end. And in the presence of this ammonia, we will get white fumes of ammonium bromide, and that will be confirming that we've made hydrogen bromide. Now, the simple chemical equation for what's happening involves molecular formulae. So there's hexane, and it's going to react with bromine. And we do write UV over the arrow because that ultraviolet light is vital. And then it's going to produce bromohexane and hydrogen bromide. And we should really put state symbols in for all of these. So hydrogen bromide is a gas. The bromohexane is a liquid, bromine is also a liquid, and the hexane is a gas. And it's this bromohexane that is our halogenoalkane. I mentioned earlier that this was a simplified equation, and the reason that this is simple is that it uses molecular formulae for the two main organic compounds. In practice, what you ought to do in exams is you should write these as structural formulae because that leaves no doubt about the identity of the chemical that is being formed. The reason I didn't here is because in practice what would happen is that we would get a mixture of bromoalkanes forming in this instance and we don't actually know which one is being formed. The good news is in exams they will be very specific and they will tell you the identity of the halogenoalkane that you are making. Let's look at a simple reaction for free radical substitution, one that is most commonly encountered in exam questions and it's the main one that's mentioned on all exam specifications. And this is the reaction between methane gas and chlorine gas to make chloromethane and HCl. And this should have UV above the arrow because this will only happen in the presence of ultraviolet light. This reaction involves three steps that happen one after the other. The first step is initiation, and that is really clear that it's the first step because to initiate means to start something. And then the second step is propagation. And that's the most complicated word of these three. To propagate in this context means to kind of spread the reaction on and to keep it going. And termination, well, that's nice and logical that termination is the ending of the process. This type of reaction is often referred to as a chain reaction because once the ultraviolet light has initiated the process, that leads on to propagation and termination without us having to do anything else at all. So one thing follows immediately on from the other. Now, what I'd like to do just before we dive down into each of these three steps is just to explain why this reaction has the name that it has. So first of all, it's called a substitution reaction, and that's really common as part of a mechanism's name. And it's called a substitution reaction because one atom is replacing another. In this example up at the top, we've got a chlorine coming in to take the place of one of the four hydrogens. You'll notice there are only three hydrogen atoms at the end. And it's called free radical substitution because it is free radicals that cause this reaction to happen. And so together we combine that free radical substitution and the chemist will know that one atom is replacing another and free radicals are the cause. The first step called the initiation step in this reaction is the breaking of the bond between the halogens in the diatomic halogen molecule. And we can show the equation like this and we can write UV for the ultraviolet light that does it. It is slightly better and looks more professional if we write it like this, Cl2, turning into two of these chlorine free radicals. Again, using ultraviolet light. And so if you are asked to write the initiation step of a halogenoalkane synthesis that uses chlorine, what I've just put in that black box that is what you write. To explore that a little bit more deeply for your understanding is that 
what we've got is we've got two chlorine atoms that are sharing a pair of electrons. The ultraviolet light gives the atoms more energy, and so what happens is they take these electrons, and they take one each. And what we do is we draw an arrow that curls from one of the electrons back to the chlorine. And the same thing happens for the other one. And these arrows are like the curly arrows in other mechanisms, and we do call them curly arrows, but they are more fish-hooked shaped. And what that means is that represents one electron, because other curly arrows, more mainstream curly arrows that you'll see more often, have got a full kind of head to the arrow, and that represents two electrons. And so, as you can see from the curly arrows, each chlorine takes one of the electrons from the bond. And so the bond breaks equally, and we end up with these two chlorine free radicals. which will go on and cause the rest of this reaction. Now, this process, and I would like you to remember this name, this process is called homolytic fission. And this name is very, very logical if you look at the etymology. Fission means to split, and lysis means to divide, and the homo means the same, so it is an equal divide ending up with a split between these two atoms in the molecule. So they've split equally. It's not one atom taking both electrons, it is one electron going to each atom. So homolytic fission, it's an equal split. Now I've already said that these free radicals are very, very reactive, and that causes the rest of the reaction to happen, the propagation steps. It's worth mentioning at this point that in our reaction mixture, if you remember the overall equation, there will also be carbon to hydrogen bonds in the alkane. Now these bonds are stronger than the halogen to halogen bond. I'm not just putting Cl to Cl because it doesn't have to always be chlorine. But they're stronger than the bond in the halogen and so therefore the ultraviolet light is not strong enough to break this bond. And so these bonds don't break. The second stage in this process is propagation. And a propagation reaction is defined as where a free radical reacts and then a new free radical forms. The propagation stage is usually the stage that people find the most complicated. And that's because there are two parts to the propagation step. The good news is there is a lot of crossover between each of the two equations. There's a lot of commonality. In the first stage, what happens is a chlorine-free radical, very, very reactive, remember, takes one of these hydrogen atoms from the methane. It tears it away because it is so reactive, and then it turns into hydrogen chloride, a stable compound. What that leaves, though, is this methyl-free radical. This has got a carbon atom with an unpaired electron on it. So we've used one free radical, very reactive, and we've made a different, very reactive free radical, which goes on to react in stage two. In the second step, the methyl free radical that we've just made reacts with a chlorine molecule that hasn't yet been broken apart by the ultraviolet light. And this produces the chloromethane, a stable molecule, and also another chlorine free radical. There are several things to note here. First of all, this chlorine free radical that has been produced in the second stage can go around and begin the whole process again and react with another methane molecule. The next thing to point out to make our lives easier is that there is quite a bit of repetition in here. A chlorine free radical is used in the first equation and it's produced in the second equation. Additionally, we are using in the second stage the methyl free radical that was produced in the first stage. And so, in fact, what we're doing is not remembering eight different structures, we're only remembering six. And the third really clever thing is that these two equations, if you add them together, provide massive clues about whether you've written this correctly. So let me add these two together now. And to do this, I've just taken everything that is a reactant and added all four of those things together. 
And if I do the same thing about everything that is on the right hand side in the products, all I've done is I've literally added the two sides of those two equations together to give four things on the left and four things on the right. And just like in any regular equation, particularly in ionic equations, if something appears on both sides of the equation, we get rid of it. So there is a chlorine free radical at the beginning, there is a chlorine free radical at the end. There is a methyl free radical at the beginning. There is a methyl free radical at the end. So what you can see, I hope, is that what's left once we've simplified this is the overall equation for the reaction that was on the first page where we started discussing this. And so then there are two helpful things to ensure that you can remember what happens in the propagation step. The first is that the chlorine free radical that is used also appears again in the second equation and that the methyl free radical made in the first equation appears again in the second equation. So that's helpful tip number one. Helpful tip number two is that the four other chemicals that you need to remember, they are the four chemicals that appear in the overall equation. So actually you've got quite a lot of clues about the propagation steps. And just to repeat the word I mentioned before about this being a chain reaction, the fact that this chlorine is produced in the end of the second step and can go back to the beginning and do this again, that means it can take place thousands and thousands of times before these chlorine free radicals eventually get used up. And the way these chlorine free radicals could get used up is the final stage in this free radical substitution mechanism, which is termination. And in termination reactions, two free radicals react together, and so they are removed from the reaction mixture. There are actually three potential termination steps in this process. The first one is the one I've just mentioned, which is when one chlorine free radical reacts with another chlorine free radical, and we remake our chlorine molecule, which could in theory then get broken apart by more ultraviolet light. Another one is where a chlorine free radical reacts with a methyl radical, and we end up making more of our desired product, which was chloromethane. And then the final termination step that could occur is where a methyl free radical reacts with another methyl free radical, and we end up making a totally different product, which would be ethane, C2H6 in terms of its molecular formula, and CH3, CH3 in terms of its structural formula. And so three possible termination products. In each case, these products are now stable, unlike the free radicals from which they formed. Overall, then, what's happened in a free radical substitution reaction is a halogen has replaced a hydrogen atom in the original alkane, and a hydrogen halide has also been produced. Now, I've written the accepted abbreviation for hydrogen halide as HX on here. Now what we mean by that is something like HCl for hydrogen chloride, HBr for hydrogen bromide, HF for hydrogen fluoride, and HI for hydrogen iodide. And you can see it's a lot easier as an abbreviation to just say X, where X could be any halogen. And this is the overall equation that we've just been looking at. If we have a look at a few others, I'll write them all at once and you can see if you can finish them. Here we go then, five examples that you can now pause and see if you can work these out yourself as to what would form. Hopefully you've had a go at that then. And in terms of what we would make, the first two are almost identical to the one that I've already written. The only difference is that in each case, instead of using the halogen chlorine, we've used the halogen bromine in reaction number one. In reaction number two, we used the halogen fluorine, and so we're going to make fluoromethane and hydrogen fluoride. The third equation looks more complicated but it really isn't. We're going to make from our ethane, we're going to make chloroethane which would look like this and we're going to make hydrogen chloride. In fact the second product should be a freebie almost. We're going to make HCl in each of these cases and the reason is just to note one of the chlorines is going to replace one of the halogen atoms and the other chlorine is going to grab that hydrogen atom and make the hydrogen halide. So whatever our diatomic halogen is, 
that's going to be the halogen that goes into the hydrogen halide product. And so our last one would be HCl as well. And then the halogenoalkane in this case is more complicated because it's already a halogenoalkane. But in fact, it's no different because what would happen is one of the halogens will kick out a hydrogen and it will be replaced by another halogen. And so we had CH3Br at the beginning. We're going to end up with CH2Br with a chlorine joined on. So the only difference is that one of those hydrogen atoms has been removed and it's been replaced by the chlorine. And this last one looks even more complicated because there are two halogen atoms in there already, but we can ignore them almost because the reaction is going to take place by removing one of those hydrogen atoms and replacing it with this halogen. And so we're going to produce at the end of this process CH because we've got one less hydrogen atom and it's going to be a complicated molecule in terms of its formula with BrIcl. And in fact, what it would look like is one carbon with a hydrogen, a bromine, and an iodine, and a chlorine all joined together. So that would be what this one would look like. I think it's fair to say that those last ones were a little bit more complicated, where we had the reactant that was already a halogenoalkane. But just to remind you, the core principle is that it's the hydrogen atom from the original alkane or in this case halogenoalkane that gets removed and it gets replaced by a bromine. And so we end up with CH2 because we've lost one of the hydrogen atoms and the bromine comes on and takes its place. And so we end up with a halogenoalkane that's got two different halogens on or could be two of the same halogen and the other product would be HBr. The second way that substitution can be more complicated seeming is if the product of the free radical substitution doesn't just stop there, but it reacts again. Let's take a look at the overall equation again to see what I mean. So we've got our methane reacting with the chlorine. One of these chlorine atoms tears away one of these hydrogen to make HCl, and the other chlorine joins onto the methane to make chloromethane. But chloromethane has got hydrogens that could also be substituted. So, potentially, what could happen in part two, so if we make this the first reaction, the second reaction that could happen could be chloromethane reacts with chlorine, and we end up making this, which would be called dichloromethane, and we end up making another hydrogen chloride. But why would it stop there? In theory, it could go again, because we've still got more hydrogen atoms that could be replaced. So step three would happen too. CH2, Cl2, plus the chlorine, Cl2, could make CH, Cl3, trichloromethane, and another hydrogen chloride. And this CH, Cl3 has also got a hydrogen that could still be substituted, and so that is our last possible stage that could occur. The trichloromethane could turn into tetrachloromethane. Now, each of these stages, one, two, three, and four, they would each happen via initiation, propagation, and termination in the presence of ultraviolet light. And so the practicalities of this is that we would end up with a mixture of different products that we would have to separate out using fractional distillation. And that's the case for any reaction where you end up with a mixture of products if the exam says, how could we separate this mixture? Chances are that fractional distillation will be the acceptable answer. Let's finish off exploring halogenoalkane synthesis by exploring one last complicated example where you might get a mixture of products for a totally separate reason. The simplest example of where you might get this is if the alkane was propane. And the reason that this is complicated is if we add chlorine and ultraviolet light, initiation, propagation, termination, one of these hydrogens is going to be taken away. The problem is that there are two different types of hydrogen that could be taken away. There is the hydrogen atoms joined to carbon atoms on the end of the chain, and there's the hydrogen atom in the middle. And so if we make this top arrow 
the green pathway, then what we're going to make is we're going to make a halogenoalkane with the chlorine joined on in the middle of the chain and HCl. If we follow the yellow pathway down here, we're going to get something very similar seeming, but we're going to have removed one of the hydrogen atoms from the end of the chain. And so the chlorine will be at the end of the chain as well. And so we're going to have one chloropropane, or this one would be two chloropropane. And once again, this mixture of products would be separated using fractional distillation. The good news is, in an exam, they would ask you to write initiation, propagation and termination steps that would lead you towards one of these. They would tell you which one it was that you were working towards. Let's suppose they'd asked you to write equations to show the synthesis of 2-chloropropane. The important difference between everything that I've showed you so far and this example is that you would need to be very careful about where to put that free radical dot. And it would come in here, in the propagation stage number one, where the chlorine free radical reacts with the propane and turns into the free radical that is on a carbon atom instead. And since we're making two chloropropane, the free radical needs to be on the second carbon atom on here. You would be marked down if you had it forming on one of the end carbon atoms. Everything else about those stages, initiation, propagation, termination, would be identical. It would be this first propagation step that would be different. I've mentioned before about writing formulae that are ambiguous. You could probably get away with it in the reactants because it doesn't matter, because C3H8 can only be propane, whereas the C3H7 free radical, there are two different options, and so you have to be specific there. We are going to finish this video by taking a look at how free radical substitution reactions can result in something that is very, very serious, which is the depletion of the ozone layer. Ozone is a molecule made up of three oxygen atoms, so it's got the formula O3. It looks like this in terms of the electron sharing diagram, so it's rather strange because we end up with oxygen atoms that have got three different numbers of lone pairs. So this oxygen atom on the left hand side has got three lone pairs, the one in the middle has only got one, and the one on the right hand side has got two. So between them they end up with eight electrons each, which is what they need in order to be stable, but there's a combination of a double bond and a single bond and three different amounts of lone pairs, like I say. Now ozone, the molecule O3, decomposes into oxygen in an equation that looks like this. And in one way, this reaction is a good thing because too much ozone at ground level would cause lung irritation and it would cause paints and plastics to degrade. And so the fact that this happens down at ground level is a good thing. However, up in the outer atmosphere, ozone has an absolutely vital role. If we represent the Earth here with a simple circle, and then outside the Earth we've got this green circle which represents our greenhouse gases, and beyond the greenhouse gas layer we have got the ozone layer. And the ozone layer is really important because it protects the Earth from the harmful exposure to too many ultraviolet rays from the sun. So we know that the sun produces ultraviolet rays, so here's our sun over here, and not just visible light, but ultraviolet light passes from the sun to the Earth, and the ozone layer blocks ultraviolet light. It doesn't block all of it, but it blocks a lot of it. And so without this protective layer, life on Earth would be very, very different. For example, very sensitive organisms such as plankton that live in the sea, those are at the very bottom of a food chain, they need protection from ultraviolet radiation in order to survive. Additionally, ultraviolet radiation causes skin cancer in people by damaging their DNA, by producing free radicals in our skin. And so that's what and so that's why we need sun cream to help protect from ultraviolet radiation.
the depletion of the ozone layer was caused by a set of chemicals called chlorofluorocarbons, or abbreviated to CFCs, to make it easier. Now, CFCs were used in a variety of things, such as coolants in refrigerators. The use of these CFCs has reduced in recent times because of the impact that we now know that they can have. And it's that impact that we're going to explore here in terms of depletion of the ozone layer. If we take an example of a common CFC, which is dichlorodifluoromethane, as we can see here. CFCs are gases, so when they are released down on Earth, say with a refrigerator that's been put into a landfill, and so the coolant's oozing out into the, into the land and then out into the air, they rise up into the atmosphere, they rise beyond the atmosphere because they are very low density, and they reach the ozone layer, where there is more ultraviolet light than there is down on Earth. And so this ultraviolet light causes the breakdown of the CFC, and it breaks it down into a halogenoalkane free radical and a chlorine free radical. And it's this chlorine free radical that can go on and cause such a lot of damage to the ozone layer. This again, by the way, is another example of homolytic fission, because the bond broke with an equal share of the electrons in the presence of UV light. The chlorine free radicals that have just formed go on to attack ozone molecules. This is the propagation step. And just as before, the propagation step takes place in two stages. In the first stage, the chlorine free radical attacks the ozone to make a molecule of oxygen and chlorine monoxide free radical. And then in the second propagation step, that chlorine monoxide free radical reacts with a second molecule of ozone and turns into two molecules of oxygen and a chlorine free radical. And this chlorine free radical can then go and react further. And so this is a chain reaction in exactly the same way as before. Now, in exactly the same way as before, I think this reaction is easier than it looks because we use the chlorine free radical and we make it at the end, which by the way makes the chlorine free radical a catalyst by definition of not being used up. And we also produce the chlorine monoxide free radical and we use it again in the second step. So that's an intermediate in this reaction. And then because those are used and made, we can cancel them out and so overall the reaction is two molecules of ozone turns into three molecules of O2, just like we had on the previous page. And so the propagation steps can be worked out by remembering those same two hints as before. As I've already said, this chlorine free radical can catalyze this process in a chain reaction again and again until the reaction terminates in the final step, termination step. And the termination step that we have most interest in is where one of these chlorine free radicals encounters another chlorine free radical and we end up with Cl2 and we no longer have that reactive chlorine free radical. To sum up then, this reaction is not the same as making halogenoalkanes but it follows the exact same processes where you have an initiation step where reactive free radicals are formed. It's the chlorine free radical that's particularly reactive. It then follows into the propagation step, where in a chain reaction, one chlorine free radical causes two reactions to occur, and then it repeats again. And finally, this reaction ultimately ends when two chlorine free radicals terminate by reacting together. And so the overall equation of this catalyzed process is the same as the uncatalyzed reaction, but it happens through a different pathway. That's further evidence as why the chlorine free radical is considered to be a catalyst, because it provides an alternative route through this complicated set of free radicals, but ultimately the equation for the overall reaction is the same. We end up with two ozone molecules making three oxygen molecules, 
and that's exactly the same as when this happened by itself, uncatalyzed by chlorine. Okay, that's the end of this video. I hope you found it useful. We'll be back again soon, taking a deeper look at halogenoalkanes and then following up in a second video, looking at alkenes. Hope that was useful. See you next time. Bye-bye.